Welcome to Through the Lens of Christ, a podcast designed to have conversation about things that are happening in culture, questions that we may have theologically, um, and other questions that impact our day in and day out lives. Our desire is to be able to build these conversations and to be able to get us to critically think, not just about the events that are happening, but how do we see these events through the lens of Christ. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and I hope it helps you to critically think through issues in our lives. Good morning, Steve, Ashley. How are you both doing? Good. Good. Good morning. Let me start to uh, another what's to be interesting week. So happy to uh, be able to come together and, and be able to talk about the text a little bit. Um, again, as, we, as we've been sharing like this, this text along with chapter 10 um, is the same story, the same um, uh, message that's behind it, but clearly such an important message because God is repeating it multiple times to us because I, you know, we've talked about it before, but it's just not, it's not natural for us. Um, what, what God is, is pushing onto Peter and what he's revealing to us and the, the Jews at the time is just, it's, it's opposite of our, of our um, nature often. So um, important points. So we'll, we'll get into it, Steve, if you'll read chapter 11, 1 to 18. Yep, we'll get started. Um, Here we go. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. Something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, "Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter." He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, again, a, a big big chunk of this is, is recount. Peter's recounting his story of his vision and Cornelius and how all of those things fit together because the the believers, the Jewish believers, just Again, they, they don't understand it. So Peter goes back through the story. So what uh, in, in the text, like what, what stood out or what we talked about on Sunday, what stood out? Well, if I start with the text, if you don't, I'll just jump in. Um, there, there are a couple things that are different, right? First of all, these, these other brothers, the circumcision party criticizing him, that I think we kind of, we would expect in the cultural moment um they're like questioning him hey you sure you did the right thing peter so that was one thing but in the story itself there was a difference um there was a difference when he talks especially about cornelius's story because there's an addition in there in verse 14 so in verse 14 or 13 says send to joppa and bring simon who is called peter then verse 14 he will declare to you a message and here's the addition, by which you will be saved, you and all your household. 
I don't think that was in the earlier in the earlier chapters where it said this message he's going to bring is a message by which you're going to be saved. I don't remember seeing those words in those earlier texts, and I think that's kind of an important addition. So it does kind of go to the point that we've been making for like a month now or three weeks at least. Um, you know, Cornelius has, has Peter coming and he's pretty excited about it because he thinks he knows what's going to happen, which means, again, it goes to some speculation. I think part of Cornelius's prayers are, Lord, save me. And this is the means by which that's done. So that's yeah. one thing. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's a few more things, but that's that's one. Yeah, I think I think it's a big distinction, right? Because he doesn't say it in uh, chapter ten. He just says, "Go get Peter," because um, you need to talk to him, right? Your your prayers, your offerings have come up before God, so go get Peter. And mm -hmm. then when Peter says, "Hey, this was the message that Cornelius was given," I, I do think that's that's it. Kind of rounds out the story for us, right? That part of Cornelius, he was Cornelius was acknowledging that he wasn't saved. Right. He was acknowledging that there's something missing. And I think he was trying to say, God, please take my offerings. Please count these as favorable. Please. Right. And, and in some way, imploring God that, that this would be sufficient. And God's response to that is basically, no, it's not sufficient. Yet I see your heart and I'm going to show you what is sufficient. Yeah. And yeah. That, it, it's a great point. I think so, too. But, you know, the other part of that statement is, of course, the whole household thing. Uh, which, you know, and someone that believes in infant baptism would say, well, there's some evidence right there, right, that, you know, households are saved, that, the, you know, the head of the household gets saved and everybody else comes along with him and they were all baptized. And as a friend of mine would all often say, he says, well, you know, so there, the assumption is, well, there's children there, there's, there's infants there and they're baptizing babies, right? And my other friend would say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that there's an older member of the household that's a rebellious person and doesn't have anything to do with God. And they're going to baptize him too, if he's going to baptize the whole household. So the, the yeah. Baptist in me says all the people that were saved that day got baptized, <laughs> not just a bunch of people that happened to be at the right location in the right family, but especially when we're talking about ethnicity and the no distinction, the distinction is faith. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who come to christ yeah and the the text says that the holy spirit came on everyone that was there right so it's whether whether it's infants or not which my my argument is that there, there weren't but we don't know right you're arguing from a place of silence right we have no idea so like but what we do know is the holy spirit came on everyone that was there so god was the one who was saving everyone that was there the natural outcome was to be baptized. So God saves who he wants to save. I, I don't understand how a baby could have some confession of that Holy Spirit interaction, but God can do what he wants to do. But no, I don't, I certainly don't think it's a, and you're right, this, I didn't get into it on Sunday because there's so many other things to talk about, but, mm -hmm. um, but it is a point of contention and it is usually the text used for support of uh, infant baptism. So good good point it's just it's one of those like if you want if you desire infant baptism that text is going to read as though it supports it if you don't want infant baptism we've got a hundred reasons why it doesn't support it then. right right yeah I, I just go to faith salvation baptism all string together yes exactly and the holy spirit coming down i think the point of this too is the holy spirit coming down is is a saving spirit he come, the Holy Spirit comes and changes them and makes them new creations. So it's not just an, it's not an Old Testament visitation of the Spirit. It's the Pentecostal, it's the Pentecost visitation of the Spirit, right? It's not a Spirit that comes and goes. This is the Spirit of salvation that comes and resides within and connects the believer to Christ, making us in Christ together. Now we have relation and a relationship in Christ by the Spirit. Um, that ties us together as a as a covenant family. Yeah, and it, you know, I, I really think that I don't have this all figured out, right? It, you've got this whole of uh, Calvinistic and Arminian view of how salvation happens, whether it's God centered, man centered, right? I I I hope it's clear. I have a very God sovereign view of everything that happens, right? Like this is a God ordaining and God moving and God doing and. I really think this text is one of the clearest in terms of how salvation happens, right? So you've got 
all the effort by man, Cornelius, which is proving to be futile for salvation. And so I think that's like one, right? That, that this isn't something that we can earn. Cornelius couldn't earn it. Something else had to be done. You see God moving in a believer in Peter to go bring a message of salvation back to Cornelius, right? So there's something happening. God clearly softened the heart of Cornelius to make him desire to be a God-fearer, to make him desire to follow the rules, but it wasn't enough. So he pairs him up with Peter, who's coming to share the message of salvation, says that God grants repentance that leads to life. So this idea of repentance, right? So we don't know exactly what's happening in Cornelius in the household, but we have enough breadcrumbs to say like, okay, so there's some God softening the heart, God sending the gospel message. Peter's a, a, a obedient in being an ambassador. He presents the good news. They hear the good news. There's the ability to repent. God sends the Holy Spirit as an act of saving grace. The people then believe and then they're baptized. And I just, I just think there's this like clear image in here that I don't know how you can come away from this thinking that you know what, man makes his own decisions and man, like, yes, there is some component where we're responsible for the rejection of the truth of Christ, right? That's mm -hmm. the rejection of Christ is what sends us to hell for eternity. Um, so we're responsible for that. But there, I don't think we can claim any responsibility for the salvation of, of who we are. And so I just think it's a, a, it's a good reminder that God is in all parts of this and moving in his will and purposes yeah yeah so 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 i think the calvinist says i let that i let that stand right i don't understand how those things work together and others will say well i know how they work together somebody has to decide and choose and make sure all right so so yeah you made the you made the point you made the point well made point on sunday repentance is a gift yeah repentance is i mean it's, it's a gift in this text it's a gift in other text repentance is a, is a gift um yeah. faith is a gift faith is a gift too saving faith is a gift so the kind of faith that saves i mean we can look up some texts of scripture and talk about that as well so so you know yeah i i, I think part you know part of that whole thing is we are um we're preloaded to understand that it's our choice that we make a choice toward christ and salvation and oftentimes i think later on we find that you know God has done a whole lot of pre-work, just like in this situation. There's a lot of things that have been going on, have been totally outside of my control, that have had massive influences on me. And, and at some point, because of the way God's created me, because of the things that I've gone through, the experiences I've had, who I am as a person, as a, and what happened to me in that instant, God has worked all those things in a way that saved me. Whatever it took at the moment, the Holy Spirit comes down, changes yeah. us offers us yeah and it, it and gives it us depends. saving faith and, re, and 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 repentance at the same time they come together right yeah well and that's one of the texts i picked uh, second timothy chapter two but where paul tells timothy like reach talk to your opponents gently right he says if with your opponents give them gentle instruction with the hope that god will grant repentance and i think so often and especially right now culturally like we want to we want to yell people into salvation right we want to argue people into obedience and I, now listen i i like listening to the debates of some of the really strong apologetic minds right just because i i think they have a good handle on things and good arguments against certain worldviews and but i don't see those as being evangelistic conversations right they're they're just logical heady kind of like i don't see those leading to salvation i've never yet seen a, an, an apologetic debate where the atheist at the end of it goes now i believe right now now i get it so it's that you're just entrenching people in their own views so i don't see them as productive evangelically but yet we certainly like that's we just get upset we see the world as broken as it is we get emotional about it and we want to yell people down to where they'll just in some way miraculously believe, which again is a very, uh, a, it's a very man-centered view that if I can develop a convincing enough argument, then I'm going to change your mind and you're going to believe. And that text in second Timothy is like, that's not how it works. We need to gently instruct people. We need to winsomely present the gospel. We need to pray. We need to be patient and God will grant out of his saving grace repentance that leads to the saving knowledge of the truth and again trying to keep that in right order 
that really removes the pressure from us to get it right. It doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't be doing missions. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be evangelistic. We have to be. It's just how do we do it? No, that's, yeah, that's definitely helpful. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's definitely helpful. There's a lot to that. Yeah. So, so what else? So Ashley, what was, what was something that stood out in, in this text or over the last couple of weeks or with, with something that stands up? Um, I think with what you just shared, there's that, like, you can't argue people into salvation. Um, and that's not what Peter demonstrated over these last you know, five weeks of reading this same type of text. That's not what he modeled. That's not what he, that's not the path that he chose. Um, and just that continued need of daily repentance for us to be able to actually align ourselves with the way that Christ requires us to live. It's not, you know, and scripture is clear about that. Take every thought captive, you know, remove, renew your minds daily. Those are all important things to keep in mind in our act of evangelism as well, that it needs to be not only through what our words are saying, but what our actions are demonstrating as well. Yeah, I think that, I, you know, I tried to spend some time on that idea of repentance, mm -hmm. right? Understanding this, this action isn't just simply a, a, a mouth confession. And, you know, even Paul in Romans says that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths, like it's the believing in our heart piece that we kind of get wrong, right? It's this idea of, of genuine repentance and because we see the destruction of it and it's not just a matter of I I, I know I, I've got a I've got a sin nature and I've got a flesh or flesh nature and I've got a, a, a spiritual nature and I participate in the divine nature so there's this war within me which there is right there's spiritual warfare but yet we should hate what we're being drawn back to. And so it's it's almost like I, I don't want to lose that war. I don't I don't want to go back. And I know Satan's a strong enemy, but you know our our God is is greater. And so how do I how do I continually repent? And how do I continually live in a in a state of desiring obedience? I think that's a really good point. And fully understanding what true repentance looks like too. I think oftentimes it's easy to take the route of what we were trained as a child of oh you did something wrong now you need to go apologize say you're sorry. You know, and that's, I think we can get stuck in that same type of inauthentic repentance of, sorry, God, I did that again. Um, and not fully understanding what it means to truly be changed and to turn from those things fully. Yeah, that's, that's helpful because, because justice and reconciliation requires a mediator as well. So to turn and say, I'm sorry. I broke the plate, mom, right? Mom can say, I can fix the plate or I can replace the plate. But when we when we find out that when with the things that we break, we can't fix and we need and there needs to be someone else who can fix them. And who's that going to be? And so we have to have that that mediator, the, the mediator that tells us I've made it all. I've made it all right. I can fix that problem and I have already fixed that problem. And you can live, you can live your life with a clear conscience um, because you know me. So Christ is that mediator force. He's the one that fixes the problem. Um, but we have to trust and rely on him. We have to repent and turn to him. And then he he says, the problem's fixed. Um, relieve yourself of this burden because you love me, because you're mine. And then you can go on with your life and keep moving. Otherwise, we start carrying burdens with us that we shouldn't carry. And it weighs us down. And then we're still that, that's just being in this logical frame of mind and not a spiritual frame of mind. If we start thinking about, well, how do I act? What do I do? How do I repair it? How does it and some people can, I don't know, they, they can believe their Christ followers, followers on a logical, rational level and never get to the point of having burden relief because of the actuality of Christ's sacrifice and what it actually does. Um, it's it actually justice is served um, with Christ's death on the cross, which makes us righteous because of Christ, um, if we trust in him and love him and want to follow him. That's that's the thing. It's, it's, it's not just aligning myself with the working of the world. It's aligning myself with Christ who made the world work. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's well said. And, and just the idea that justice is served, right? I think um, sometimes it's easy to think like God just opted 
to not bring justice, right? He just kind of said, well, you know what? It, it's fine. You believe it's fine. And, you know, Jesus paid the price. Like, what does that all mean? But mm -hmm. like justice was served. It's just Jesus was the one who took it, right? So there, there was still a price to be paid. And that's part of repentance is being able to see that. And we're not going to see that on our own, right? Being able to have eyes to see it is a gift of grace, like we've talked about. And when you see it, like that should change how you view sin, right? That I, that I don't want to because I know the price that was paid. And I know that I didn't have to, to earn it back. But it, it's not like it didn't happen, right? And so, um, yeah, I think really good point. Yeah, the, the joy of rooting out sin, trying to find it. Where is it? Because we love Christ more. Um, I mean, that... There, there's there's a world of work and effort and fun and, and grace there that needs to happen. And I mean, the other thing about that is I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff when I was 35 or 40. I mean, you know what I mean? The Lord just keeps bringing new things to you as you keep going and showing you how badly you need him. Um, I don't know. I Younger people, too, need to know how badly they need him. And it's you can find out if you want to wait 30 years, but it should be nice to know. I wish I knew when I was 20. Yeah. 10, yeah. 30. Right. And I, I do think, you know, some of it is life experience and the thing like that you, you used a word that I wouldn't have used even probably 10 years ago when you're talking about rooting out sin, you said fun, right? Like, when you you do like when you're younger and when you're early in your faith and when you're trying to to make a go in this world like it's not fun it's like man i got to you know i'm having this pulled for me and that pulled for me and i've got my friends going over here and doesn't that look like fun and i've got people like this is what i want to do and this is right it's this but as you get older you realize that it is fun like god is perfecting us in a way that we're never able to do and if i desire his perfection over whatever the world has to distract me like that is fun and it just it, yeah to your point wouldn't it be great if we could see that with with clearer eyes earlier and act, instead of waiting till you know we're we're the ages that we are to to go man you know what i, I god has redefined fun for me it's part of the definition from j.i packer on on what repentance is right it's our, our a change in our wills and motives and our it's it's it changes everything and so what we define as fun changes um and you know it's we we couldn't invent that story on our own and so again it goes back to god's sovereignty changing hearts softening us redirecting us repurposing us giving us grace that that doesn't just lead to repentance but that leads to to saving faith and so we are we are thankful for that yeah for sure well thank you Thank yep. you. Thank you.